Hello, are you ready? Uh, it's going to be in English, I hope it's not a problem. Uh, I'll try to, to speak as slow as I can, as, as clear as I can. Um, it's going to be a talk about management, and I'll try to demonstrate to you what I think is the future of management, and how we practice it now. There's the only slide I have today, so there's going to be no slides, we'll just talk. And according to my experience, every time I talk about this subject, where there's a lot of questions in the room. So I decided to keep my talk as short as possible for about 20 minutes, and then I'm sure you will have questions. Um, I, I, I was thinking about how to start, and I decided to start with explaining my experience of my work in the United States and uh, Europe. As a, uh, as a developer, as an architect, as a consultant, as a full-time worker, sort of. And uh, my experience is kind of funny, so I'll try to, to show you a few rules which I learned. And my basic question in all cases were, uh, the question was, why do I really have to work if they still pay me? So I work good, they pay me. I don't work, they still pay me. Uh, I kind of try to understand what is the, actually the reason to work hard, even though I like to work, I like to see results of my work, but I didn't know, I mean, what, what's the main motivation for me? Well, eventually all of them fired me, but it's not the point. Uh, my point is that I found a number of rules, which I'll share with you now, uh, which uh, kind of, if you use the same, you will stay in the company for some time, for sure and it will help you to go up in the hierarchy of the, of this, of the company. So, uh, the first rule is overtime. You absolutely have to work overtime, and nothing explains better to your management that you're a good developer than the overtime you work for. So you have to stay after the work hours for as long as you can, but don't do it too often, so like two, three times a month, and that will help you to demonstrate them that you are really reliable programmer. A good code, they don't understand good code. Amount of lines of code, amount of features is not so important. What's important is how long you stay after the, you know, the office is closed. And I actually, I, I, I've been in many discussions with the management uh, about who deserves highest salary, who are the programmers, when I was kind of on, you know, on the level of management. And all the time it's the question of, you know these guys, this guy, he stayed with us, he stayed till noon or till midnight a few times last month, he's a really good developer. And the management understands that. They don't understand that this guy actually writes clean code and you know, the, 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 the Java classes he creates are really easy to understand. It's not the point. What they care about is how long this guy stayed in the office. So I would say and one overtime till midnight is more important than a thousand lines of good code. The second rule is responsibility. Don't take personal responsibility. So always stay in the team. Don't let them assign tasks personally to you. Always say we, don't say I. So this is our task, this is our project, this is our responsibility. Because if something fails, they will definitely blame you personally. But if it's something succeeds, it's going to be the team success. So don't, don't take personal responsibility. That's important. And if they catch you doing that, say that, you know, Agile says that. So the Agile says it's team responsibility, it's not personal responsibility. <laughs> so you're going to be, you're going to be good. Um, next, don't criticize anything. Don't say bad things about the code somebody created. Don't say bad things about the architecture. You have to radiate love, appreciation, friendship, happiness. That's what will make you, you know, a, a, good, a good developer. That's what will help you to go up in the hierarchy. Don't tell them that this code sucks and that code is wrong and, and that developer is creating this crap and again and again. That will only, you know, that will only help you to get rejected from the team. Like in that, you know, popular, don't be, <laughs> that's my point, don't be the guy who is fighting for the truth. It's like in this famous Russian Mafia game, you know, the more you talk, the more you're trying to find who's the Mafia, the higher the chances to get kicked off. So don't do that in the team. Always, you know, be, I mean, like everything you see around you, the architecture, the code, everything. Next, meetings. You absolutely have to be in all meetings you can be at. So this is very important. I would even say that the senior architect, the senior you are, the, I mean, senior developers, senior architects, they don't write code. They attend meetings. So if you want to be, you know, if you want to be the, 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 the more well-paid, if you want to be higher, then you should attend more meetings and write less code. This is obvious. Even organize meetings if you can. 
call people together, organize meetings, talk to them. This is how you be a good developer. This, that's what you are if you're a good art engineer. You have to do that. And actually, meetings is the only way management can understand that something is going on. They don't like people you know, sitting in front of the computers and doing something. They don't feel like what's going on because who knows what they're doing. They want to see us sitting together in the room and talking about, of course, business, what else. So they want to see us talking. When, you, when the management is asking what the team is doing, then, okay, we're discussing something. That's great. The management is comfortable, relaxed. Okay, these guys are busy. So be the guy who's in that meeting. That's really important. The next one, well, I have a friend who was, uh, it's a funny story, I had a friend, I have a friend who was not really, he didn't like that meeting that much, stupid guy, so he really wanted to write code, and, and, but he was a consultant and he was paid by the hour, so he was in the office and he had to be in the office, and he had to, they paid him for the time he's in the office, I mean, doing something, writing code, and they were always bringing him to the meetings, and he was like, you know, let me get out of that meetings. I don't know what they're for. So he created a software for an application for, for his smartphone, an app for his Android, uh, which was showing the amount of money he's making while sitting in the meeting. So he was just starting an app and looking at it and like, okay, all right, I'll be here because you know the amount is coming up and up and up. So that kind of helped him to be in the meeting. Maybe you will need the same, just create something, but be in that meeting. Uh, next, money. Don't talk about money ever. This is like a really wrong subject to touch. So don't mention money, don't mention your salary, don't try to discuss that, because this is what scares the management. The management gets scared if you talk too much about the money, because you, I mean, they, they keep the, the, our salary secret, so we don't know how much each of us is making, and they need to keep it that way. Again, a funny story I had like a, a few years ago, it was a startup, and uh, we were, <laughs> We didn't know what the salary were, everybody, so it was a secret. And then one day they were preparing for the investment, investment or something, so the document with the salaries got leaked to the office, so, so we just saw this document. And then a few people were just coming to the management saying like, hey, I'm getting like 50% less than this guy sitting next to me. So what's wrong? It started, this, this whole conversation started. And the management was not sure what to do. It was a kind of scary situation because they were afraid of people could leave the company. So they blamed, guess who? The guy who leaked the document. So that was the guy who was guilty, you know, the guy who actually, you know, let this document be visible by, by programmers. So don't touch this subject, don't, manage, don't mention money at all, just keep it secret and you will be fine. That will be, increase your chances to, you know, to stay longer in this team. And the last one, um, you have to express, you have to, uh, you have to tell as much as you can about the corporate values. So you, you should work not for the code, you should not deliver the code, I would say, but you should care more about the corporate values. You should always say, you should always discuss in all the technical meetings, you should always mention how big is going to be our company, how important it is for our customers. Always care about big values, not about the bloody Java code. That will also help you to you know, to be more appreciated. So you have to wear a t-shirt with the brand name, always, you have to have a cup, you know, mug with the, with the brand, you have to be a part of the team. So I would say that writing good code, anybody can do, but be a good part of the team, a real member of the team, it's not so easy. So this is way more appreciated than, 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 than you writing a good code. So be a team player. So I, that's it. So I guess you understood that I was joking, right? So uh, all of these rules, they, they were actually will help you to stay in the team, in the project, but they will ruin the project, of course. So this is, what, no, this is not what the effective management is. And, uh, and now I'll show you how we manage programmers. In a completely different way. So this XDSD was created six years ago as, a, as an idea as a methodology for management, and the core principle of that is basically one core principle is that everybody, everybody is paid for results. Not for the time, but for results. So all the programmers, designers, architects, everybody who is in the project, who is in the team, has to get money when the results, when the results are delivered. And there are a few, like, well, five things I would say, and then I will expect your questions. So I'm kind of close to the end. So first of all, we manage, the way we manage development we write in Java, so we're, I'm a Java developer as well, so I'm also you know, taking part of our team. Uh, first of all, we give personal micro-tasks to programmers. So all of our programmers, including myself, we all get tasks personally assigned to us. And each task is really small, 
Usually it's less than an hour, like in size and in budget. And when the task is finished, at that moment of time, the developer gets money. So we're not paying salaries by the end of the month. We're not paying for the time spent in the office. We don't even have offices. So people work remotely. They deliver results, and when results is delivered, or results are delivered, the money gets to their, the money comes to their account or to their bill, whatever. So all we have many, many micro tasks. So each programmer usually have in, in, in the agenda like 15 or 20 tasks, but each of them is really small, half an hour or one hour micro tasks. And it's always a personal responsibility. So it's never a team. So we don't play this team thing. We always put the task on the person. If the person can complete it, the task is completed. If the person cannot do that, we'll just give it to somebody else. So we never give tasks to a group of people, and then you know, nobody knows who is responsible. Second, uh, we have really strict quality control after each task. So the developer, how many developers are here who write code? OK, that's almost everybody. And how many managers are here? OK, just about 15 people. That's good. So uh, we have three levels of control after you or me, a developer, creates code. We, we work through GitHub. So the task comes to the developer, then some code has to be created in a pull request. The pull request comes to us back to the repository. And then, first of all, we do the mandatory code review. So there's one code reviewer who has to validate everything and say, I like it. And we pay that code reviewer. If the code reviewer says, no, I don't like this code, we still pay that person. If the code reviewer says, yes, I like that code, after a few comments, we still pay that person. So the code reviewer, in that case, doesn't care about what's going to be the outcome of this code. If you like it, if, I, if I'm the code reviewer, I have no incentive, I don't have any, I don't, I'm not motivated to say, yes, I like it, or no, I don't like it. I mean, in any case, I will get my money. So the code reviewer kind of objectively reviews the code and says, yes or no. The second level is the architect of the project, does the second review and says, I like it, don't know. And, and also we pay for, the, for, for this review. And then this, in step number three, we have a, a, a merging server, which gets that code, merges together with the master branch, and, and pull, pushes it back. So like, like Nikolai uh, was explaining yesterday, we have a, a strict control of the master branch, and the master branch, nobody can push to the master branch. So only this machine, only this computer, can actually do the merge, the merge uh, procedure. So there are three steps of quality control. One review, second review, and then the automatic merge. So well, my point is that it's really difficult for the developer to push the bad code into the master branch. And at the same time, we pay only when the code gets to the master branch. So it's a big conflict. I mean, you understand how we achieve quality. So there are no compromises. So there's no need to be, you know, to be a friend in this environment. Because when you review the code, you don't care about who's, who the code belongs to. You just review objectively. You say yes or no, and it goes in. Uh, the rule number, kind of, not the rule, but the idea number three is that we call it no obligations. On one side, you as a developer can say no to any task which we give you. So the task comes to you, and here's the task like fix this bug. If you don't feel like it, if you don't like that bug, if you don't work, if you don't want to work with it, you just say no, and that's it. It's our problem, it's the problem of the manager. So the manager has to find somebody else and assign this task to somebody else. So programmers have no pressure, no overtime, none of these things I explained before. You just sit comfortably, some, comfortably somewhere in Thailand, the tasks are coming to you, you just look at them and say, I don't like this one, I like that one. Usually people accept most of the tasks, but about 15, 20% they reject because they just don't like the, 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 the task description, they don't understand it, they don't feel like it's you know, good enough. Uh, you know, easy enough to implement. So we say no obligations means that we don't expect you to be uh, to promise us anything. Just if you don't like it, don't accept it. But on the other side, we also don't promise you as a developer that if you don't complete it in some time, we give you some period of time. This is the task you have to finish it in a certain amount of days. If you don't finish it, we have no. Even if you even if you tried, even if you wrote a lot of code, even if you submitted your pull request, but the time is over. We just say goodbye and we cancel everything and we give it to somebody else. So you don't promise us anything and we don't promise anything. So like again I'm saying, sometimes people try to complete the task, they spend some time, the task is small, like half an hour or one hour, the developer spends three hours 
and then on five hours, and then it doesn't work, he can just, or she cannot fix the bug, and then complains like, hey guys, it's already five days, and we're saying, sorry about that, stop it, we throw it away. So it's kind of a waste of time for the developer, but it's on both sides. Thing number four, and then I have one more. Uh, no meetings. We have absolutely zero meetings at all. So we never meet all, well, we don't have any office at all, so people don't sit together, that's first. But we don't see each other in Skype, we don't see each other in Slack, we don't communicate in, in, uh, in all by the phone, we don't call each other, we even don't know how uh, most of us look like. So we work right now with about 100 people. So we, in all these people we work for, I'll, tell, I'll give you some numbers a bit later, but we work for at least two years with these guys. And we never talk on any, 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 like any media except GitHub. So all our conversations happens happen in, in GitHub tickets. So here's the task, there are comments, like in open source projects, you know how they work most. Here's the ticket, the comments, 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 pull requests, discussions around code, everything happens there. So nowhere we have any informal communication. So we don't talk about you know, weather and uh, how was the, the movie yesterday, we don't have that stuff at all. So all our conversations stay strictly in the ticket, strictly attached to the specific task. No meetings where we discuss plans, agendas, problems, scrums, stand-ups, all of that. We don't have that at all. <laughs> that should surprise you a little bit, I guess. And the, yeah, and the thing, the last thing which I wanted to mention is that uh, we randomly assign tasks to programmers. Randomly. So we don't have this. We we, we have this uh, collective code ownership to the extreme case. So in our case, it's really collective ownership. So the entire team really owns the code. So you cannot say that this piece of code, this class, belongs to uh, to Jeff, because Jeff created it, and don't touch it because it belongs to me. Only Jeff knows how it works. We always, when when new tasks show up, when we have new bugs, new features, new ideas, new tasks, we select the person randomly through the through the pool of developers in the project. And usually, it's about 15, 20 people in the project. So we just randomly select a person and give, this is, your, this is your task to fix. And sometimes people say, hey, I don't understand because it's a Jeff code, because it's not created by me, so there's some complaints, but we resolve that. Well, we, we resolve that, and I'll explain you later how, but the idea is that we don't have anything, anybody in the team who is a subject matter expert, so called. So we are strongly against the subject matter experts. We think, we think this is an evil, evil, uh, uh, part of any project. So if you have somebody in your team who knows more than everybody else and who's an expert because that person knows how that piece of code works, then it's a big problem for the project. So you should get rid of that. Not people, but, but that situation. So you should rotate people, but that's what we do. We rotate people all the time to make sure that everybody kind of understands everything on the same level. And it's not just about people understanding that code, but it's about the code being good enough to be understood by anybody else, by, 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 by anybody. So it means that today, uh, the five people understand that code because they were working on it for a few months. But then tomorrow I can invite the person number six, and that person will jump in and will understand everything in like less than a day. So in order to achieve that, that level of maintainability of the code, we need to rotate people all the time. So we need to like move them left and right in order to, to prevent that experts from, show up, from showing up. So I'm summarizing. So this whole thing was invented as an idea six years ago. For the last four years, it's been in like active, actively, you know, act, people work with it. We completed over 25 projects, most of them on GitHub. Some of them are open source. You can see how it works. You can see how we communicate there and how we develop code. Um, over 200 developers were working with us. Right now, there are less than 50 actively working, about 100 in the pool, but overall, it's 200 people actually went through the system and learned how it works. And we wrote, to my estimate, about 300 lines, 300,000 lines of code, mostly Java. Like 80%, 90% of that code is Java. And it's back end systems, so it's not, you know, easy, it's not systems which are you know, easy to create. It's really complex systems, mostly for big data, for data analysis, for, um, for server-side data processing, that kind of thing. Um, that's probably what I wanted to say. Now I think you have questions. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. Uh, you described, described this very interesting methodology, a very interesting approach, but you described only one side. So you communicate with developers, you assign tasks. But uh, I would like to ask you about the other side. So someone should get those uh, business goals from the stakeholders or I don't know, uh, people who just want this to be done. Someone, someone has to create this whole story split it into these those micro tasks. And could you please expand on that part? Thank you. Yeah, sure. That's a good question. So uh, yeah, we have there are two situations basically, and, and the situation between that. The first is we, we have some clients, some of our clients are really smart, you know, clients smart enough to understand how this whole system works, and they stay with us in GitHub and they are able to explain what they want in GitHub tickets. So they are after like a few, like a year of work with this with this model, clients, if they're technical enough, I'm not talking about clients who just say, hey, I need a new mobile app and this is my, you know, fifteen thousand dollars, just make it for me. I'm talking about clients who have technical people on their side, their technical team here, so they're both engineers, so they know how GitHub works, they understand that rules, and they jump into GitHub and they like that system as well. So they like to communicate with developers in an open way. So they create those requirements, they create bugs, tickets, everything. But so there are some situations where customers are really like high level and they say, you know, I don't care about your system, what your, your methodology, just give it the software. In that case, in our experience, it doesn't work that well. Like, it, it's just, it's possible. In that case, we inject another person on the project who we call analyst, who is, you know, communicating with the customer by phone or whatever, and Skype, and talking the language of the customer, and then bring back requirements and post them on GitHub. So we have just an extra person who helps us to, but that situation is worse. So I think clients, if they really want to get the software done, not just spend their money, but actually get results, they need to understand how software is developed. This is the reality right now. Otherwise, it's just, you know, just waste of money. We've seen so many projects like that. Here's my money, do it for me. No problem, we spend your money. But in the end, you get something which you didn't want, something which is not going to work for you. So I believe, strongly believe, that if the customer wants to get the results, the customer has to know the rules of how programmers communicate to each other and, and be part of the team. That's my answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you for a great ideas uh, and this presentation. Uh, but I have uh, one question uh, regarding uh, task assignment. You said that uh, Nobody is obliged to uh, take uh, some task and can reject it. Uh, but at the same time, uh, you say that uh, you rotate uh, tasks between developers so that nobody uh, be an expert in some narrow area um, to avoid specializing. Uh, but uh, these two points are uh, somewhat contradictory. Uh, if it's usually easier for developer to uh, explore some narrow part of the system and take tasks only from this part of the system uh, to make it faster because it has context in his mind mm. and don't uh, switch to other areas, other parts of the system. How to prevent the situation? Well, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we understood the question, right? So on one side I'm saying that we are, we are giving tasks randomly to people and at the same time I'm saying that people are, are able to reject the task. So in that case, in the end, eventually that's logical, that, that the people will actually aggregate, I mean, they will stay together with tasks which are, which, which are better for them and reject others. Well, it may happen, but in this case, the programmer will lose a lot of money, first of all, because if you keep rejecting tasks, the amount of tasks coming to you will go down and down. And eventually, because we have the rate, we, we, don't, we don't punish you like financially, we don't say no problem, you don't like the task, we're not gonna give it, we're gonna give you something else. But if you keep saying that quite often to us, then there's a metric which says how often you reject tasks. And this metric goes up, and, and, and for, for you it's high, for me it's low. So when the new tasks show up, it will come to me first. And you will get less and less and less tasks. Eventually you will get like, you know, randomly, but just a few tasks maybe a week. And, and will seriously affect your your performance in the team, financially. So you will financially want to get more tasks and you will try to avoid it. That's what's happened, that's my experience for the last four years. But good question, that's logical. Maybe, I don't know how it's gonna behave on large scale. We have like thousands of developers and you know, hundreds of projects, but we haven't seen that, the, uh, the, the, that, that problem yet. Uh, thank you, and one more question. Uh, uh, are you 
always shows that it's always possible to break the scope in such a uh, small and uh, fully, um, with fully described requirements uh, tasks. Uh, I wonder if some new object, uh, some when the developer will uh, take a uh, a task uh, during the uh, implementation, uh, he uh, finds out that the uh, task is wrong estimated or some missed, uh, missing requirements and so on. Yeah, good question. I'll have two answers for it. Probably I'll cover the questions you have there. So first of all, we have this rule called blame the project. We call it blame the project. So always when something comes to you as a developer, the task or the problem or the bug or a piece of code, and it's not clear for you, our mentality, our mindset, we ask our developers to think the way that don't blame yourself, don't try to understand something which is not so easy to understand. Just push it back and say, for example, I'll give you an example. Uh, you have a I don't know, you have a class and there's a ticket which says, hey, this class is not doing what it's supposed to do. For example, it's a bug. And then you open this class, the Java class, and you look at it and you don't understand how it works. So it's, I mean, it's some code which is messy, which is not really clear, and you don't have enough time, but you have just one hour. So you open the task, you have one hour, and you open the class, and it's too big, and you can't understand, you, you, you realize that one hour will not be enough. So don't try, just push it back and say, create a new ticket. And say, this class, ABC, is not good enough. Refactor it for me. And then somebody, you, you create a new task. And then we assign this task to somebody else. And then somebody else will improve that class for you. And then you will get back in a few days to your main task. So you don't start your task until everything is clear for you. Until everything is, I mean, everything is obvious. So you have documentation, you have the code, everything is clear. And then when it's prepared, then you start fixing your problem. But we pay for all the bugs you create around. So you start your task, you have one hour budget, and then you start it, you say, no, I actually need here, fix, fix, fix. Three tasks. So you create three new bugs, and we pay three times for you. I mean, we pay some certain amount of money for all these things you create. So you earn some money, you haven't even, you haven't even started to work. That's the idea. That's how we kind of help people to solve. Yeah. yeah. And how did you come to this approach? Have you had some disappointing experience with this traditional team approach, or it just had grown from uh, some uh, freelance project, open project uh, that was very efficient and you have got the idea? No, I, well, I, I, I explained my experience in the beginning of the presentation. So I explained like what was my experience working for, I mean, in full time in traditional projects for a few years in America and in, in, in Europe. And I just, I just learned that this is, this is a mess. I, I gave you this example with meetings, team responsibility, this, uh, you know, this money problems, with uh, what else, this overtimes, all that. So I, I've seen a lot of this stuff. And actually, I, I, was, I had a team of developers here in Ukraine like a long time ago, 10 years ago, a traditional outsourcing team of about 100 programmers in Dnipro. And we had exactly the same problems there. So most of the projects were failures. Most of the customers were not happy. We had overtimes. We had exactly the same. I, I just explained here. So I'm sure that you have most of you have similar problems. Just I'm saying my point is that the current management we have, the current management in, in IT and software development, it's just not effective. It doesn't work. And we, it's just for, huh? And don't you have any problems now? Well, right now we don't have that problems at all. We have different problems, of course. <laughs> yeah, we have different problems, of course, but that, let, me, let me explain the problems we have in the end. So let's, let's cover the questions first. Who is the uh, I have a question. Uh, the way you describe it, uh, you utilize mostly developers' coding skills. What about design skills? A uh, big part of uh, our job is also to design classes, interfaces, to discuss how the system will behave, uh, to, to think about architecture. Uh, especially when we talk about senior developer, it's, uh, I think, a big part of our job to discuss it and to, to come up with design and test it and validate design, create spike story and so on. It looks like you, uh, your developers only utilize coding skills of your developers and they just have those well-defined tasks and somebody else, maybe your architect, will think about that. But probably not uh, all developers happy to do just coding. They would like to design something and do prototypes and all this kind of investigation stuff? Yeah, good question. Uh, well, I understand the concern, but uh, we don't give tasks for code writing only. 
Some of our tests are for uh, document writing or analyzing architecture or thinking about what's the right database to use or thinking about what's the good approach to put this stuff on Docker or what's the, the continuous delivery pipeline or how to design continuous integration, how to configure continuous integration. So it's not about only coding. For example, there could be a task which will say, hey, right now our code is not automatically deployed to a production system. Fix it. And then somebody who's not really a low-level developer, who is kind of senior, has to jump in, look at it, and, and, and fix that problem, and can configure this continuous delivery pipeline. So, and sometimes we say, like, look, right now here's a document, the description, I mean, the, the architect, the architecture document, which says that we have to use, we use Docker, point, period. We use Docker, period, this way and that way. And then we, we say, this is the, and then we create a bug, which says, why the Docker decision was made here? Where's the explanation? What alternatives were considered? Like, why this guy or somebody who made that decision, why it was made? And then somebody steps in and says, yeah, the Docker is used because this, this, and that. And we don't use, like, Rocket or whatever, some other platform, because this, this, and that. So we improve the architecture document. It's not a coding task, it's a high-level task. And everything like that is done that way. So I believe it's possible, and just my experience, it's possible to do it in these micro steps. And I mean, steps, micro steps, some of them bigger, some of them smaller. But you can move ahead, not just code, you can move ahead, push ahead the architecture as well. Which doc the architecture is documentation. It's, you know, it has to be in paper. The architecture should not stay in the head of the architect, it has to be on paper. If it's on paper, it's editable, it's, con it's fixable, it's, you know, it's, it's discussable. So that's the answer. Yeah. What will they do if everybody will reject the same issue? Yeah, it's a good question. So what do we do if the, the, we, we put the ticket on somebody and a rejection, they gain rejection, they gain rejection? It happens. In about, this is one of the problems. Somebody asked, like, what problems do we have? This is one of the problems that we have. So, and we had it and we solved it. So it happens sometimes when the test is too complex. For example, we ask, I mean, it doesn't matter. We put some really serious problem to the developer. And he said, I don't want to deal with that. Just give me normal Java coding test. If it happens one, two, three times, and it happens about you know less than five percent of our tasks, then we increase the budget. So we just put more money on the task. <laughs> That's it. And you know, I see you laughing. But what's wrong with that? This is the original budget was like one hour, and the rate of the developer is forty dollars. So the, it was forty dollars the budget of the task, and we said, okay, you can. Nobody wants to solve it for forty, for thirty-five, for thirty-seven because different rates. Okay, let's double it. Let's give two hours for eighty bucks. And it really fixes the problem. Some people say, you know, I'm not going to do it for 2x, I'm going to do it for 3x, because it's so complex. And, and in that case, we consider, the management analyzes that. It doesn't happen often, so sometimes, like in a project, like once every two, three weeks. And then we say, okay, just multiply it by three, and then the, the programmer picks it up and fixes it. So money solved that problem easily. And everybody sees that. What's interesting? Everybody in the project can see that that guy gets three times more money for fixing that problem. It's not like this, you know, I, I mentioned before, like the salary is not hidden. It's not hidden anymore. We all know these numbers. We all know that money is actually the instrument of motivating people. It's not like a traditional team. One guy gets X salary, another guy gets 2X salary, but they're completely equal contribution to the project. And nobody understands in the management what's the difference between, the difference between the, these two programmers. Just this guy, you know, wants 2X and this guy wants X. That's it. In our case, it's not that's it. In our case, we know why we pay more to that person because he actually is fixing that task. I think it's way more healthy for the team. Who's next? Yeah, hello, my name hello. is Roman. Um, probably a couple questions. So first question is that you say people don't speak to each other. The colleagues do not know anything about each other, so you say this. Um, me, like a programmer, firstly, then I came to the project, I've got, there are a lot of developers here, they know what they're doing first week. We are sitting in the environment, we are reading the documentation, and first of all, the most important, team lead, games, and helps. He explains how project you. When you're saying, so, you do not need anyone, anybody else to help you. I don't believe, actually. When this is complicated system, 50 models, they are linked to each other, they work in complicated environment, Amazon system, cloud, and you say, <laughs> First, the kind of guy said, started writing code. Man, you know, this is not, this is not the truth. You need to have a clear roadmap. You need to understand how this project works. You need to analyze a lot of information. 
And first line of code, if you be in good luck, you'll write after one week. If you're really very smart, very clever guy. Mm -hmm. So it's my first wish. You probably did not tell us. The full story, yeah? The yeah, truth. I, I don't know the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, it's the second question. Uh, you know, mm, I like to write code. Really, I do this in part of my life. So when I write some code, and I run it locally, and the box guy comes to me, she said, listen, it doesn't work in cloud. Uh, in city, I take a seat and, ah, okay, it's your problem. But we, you, you, you told us that you put the last thing you just My work locally. It's a okay. <laughs> Yeah. What's the next? Yeah. So this is my question. Okay. Is I got it. Yeah, yeah, I have some answers. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's a good point uh, that, that in traditional projects, in most of, in all projects I've seen before, the programmer jumps in, the new developer, and it takes like sometimes a month, sometimes, well, a week is like Ukrainian reality because we're really like tough here. But in Europe, it's more relaxed. It's about two months. So for two months, nobody's going to touch you. For two months, you can do nothing. And, and if somebody comes to you and says, hey, can you implement that? You say, no, I'm still getting into it. I'm still you know, kind of learning the system. So nobody going to touch you for two months. Maybe even three if you're smart enough. <laughs> but then you will start actually writing some code. In Ukraine, it's like one week, because one week sounds crazy to me. In our case, it's literally half an hour. So we give, we, you jump into the project, we give it, and it happens. I can show you real examples. You can, show, you can see our project in GitHub. The developer jumps in. Here's the task for you. Like I said before, and, and we have, we have. I have an article in my blog said it's called no school. Uh, it's not a school, and I explain how. how what, what, what do I mean? So the developer jumps to the project. It finds that that is not clear. That is not that it will take me a month to understand what's going on. And this is the problem of a project, not a problem of a programmer. You don't. The project doesn't want you to learn something. It's not a school. We're not teaching you here that our customer is not paying to make you smarter. It's not a school. This is not what the budget is for. We don't want to teach our programmers. We want our programmers to deliver code. If they can't deliver code, it's our fault. It means that the project, the artifacts, the code, the documentation is not clear enough. And that's what we are ready to pay for. And that's what the customer can invest money in. Because when we teach programmers and they spend two months, three months to learn that and then they quit, it's a waste of money. We just wasted three months of our budget. We just paid salary for three months, and then this guy says, see you later. I'm going to go to another project and spend three months there. So it becomes a school. We just teach programmers. What's the point? Instead, we need to use that money in order to improve the code base. And then, eventually, we can remove all programmers, put new people in there, and they will next day understand what's going on and pick it up. That's what I said. We don't like subject matter experts. It's a big problem for all projects. We just found a way to solve it. And I'm, asking, I'm telling you that, that it has to be solved. You, don't, you cannot have experts in a project if you want your project to be, if, I mean, not you, the customer. If the customer wants the project to be successful and wants to, the project to be maintainable in the future, experts is the enemy. Experts are the enemy. So if you have experts in your team, if you have that people who learn a lot and they know a lot, it's a, it's a, it's a risk for you. Like imagine yourself paying money for all that. You pay money, you invest, people learn, and then people leave, and you, leave, and you lose everything. So what we do, we just say, hey, here's the task for you. If you don't understand how the code is organized, if you don't know how this cloud deployment is done, if you don't know how this DevOps work, it's quite complicated. Tell us about it. Tell us that the documentation is not complete, and we'll fix it. We'll spend money for that. We'll fix the documentation. And nobody else will ask the same question in the future. That's how, GitHub, that's how open source projects are doing. In open source projects, nobody's going to teach you how to use uh, uh, Docker. You just open the documentation. You see everything there. Because they spend money there. They spend money into improving documentation, into improving code base, into improving artifacts, not us. It's not a school. It's a project. We're doing business here. So that's our approach. So that's kind of an answer. Yeah. Thank you, Kaspish. I have a few kind of related questions. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, there is a deadline for each task, and if the uh, developer cannot hit that deadline, the task is cancelled. Yeah. Uh, who sets that initial deadline? Well, yeah, that's a question. Good question. We just give uh, no, the, 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 the same deadline for all tasks. Because they're micro tasks. So we don't have big tasks like, you know, deploy the system to the server and finish everything. We just have micro steps. 
So that's why, we, and we have many tasks. In some projects, we have thousands of tasks, literally thousands. And, and because they're so small, we give, usually we give 10 days for each task, 10 days. And in most cases, 80% of tasks, they complete in 10 days, sometimes even less. So good developers, our statistics show that the good developers, they complete in 3.5 days, three and a half days. From the moment, from the moment I give you the task till the moment I pay. So I give you the task, you, find, you understand what to do, you fix it, you send pull requests, there's code review, code review, merging, everything, and then, I, and then and you get the pay. So three and a half days, it's more or less what we have right now with good developers. Bad developers, they spend sometimes 15 days and they lose some tasks because they cannot, for example, they create something and send it for, pull for, for the code review, and the code reviewer says, no, not really good, just redo it, redo it, and then the merge conflict, merge conflict, and then time, time, and then, and then the weekend, and then boom, the task is gone. So, but we don't, like answering your questions, because there are many, many tasks, we work with big numbers, because of that, we can manage them like numbers. So we don't have like critical tasks, so we need to, Another question in this case. So this approach requires uh, some kind of uh, really strong analyst or product owner to manage all their tasks. Well, we have project managers and we have software for that. Yes, and that's what we were, you know, been developing for years. And yeah. with, with this, like deadlines and uh, possibility to cancel tasks uh, by the developer, just uh, by the developer don't want to take the task and so on and so forth. Uh, how you manage the risks? With deadlines, deeper. Well, uh, this is the second problem we have. So, <laughs> so we are not fast right now. We are not, you know, we are slower than if you put three developers in the room and then stay next to them and make them coffee. They will be faster, yes, than us. That's for sure. Because they will be in the same room, they will work over time, they will wear t shirts, everything will be fine, and they will be really faster. But in the long run, if you take like a year of work, and if you look at the quality of code we produce, and if you look at the maintainability of this code, if you look at the cost of all this development, we are five times better, according to our estimate. So, but on the, on the short run, like I get your question, yes, we have a risk of, of, you know, of, of losing some time and then delivering something slower than a team who stay together. So if somebody, if the customer says, I need it in two weeks, we just say, no, we can't do it. I mean, don't hire us because we're not about that. We're not, we're not about fast delivery. We are about the right delivery. We deliver the code in the right way. That's, that's what I think. But this is the problem we're thinking how to fix in the future. So this is what I'm working on. This is what we're working on right now. But I think that problem is smaller than the problems the traditional teams have. Hello. Thank you for the speech. Uh, I have a question. Uh, does the developer care about the product? Creativity. So how do we, do we, I mean, do our developers actually contribute to the product big picture or are they just, you know, code writing, code writing monkeys? Uh, it depends on the developer. So we don't ask, like in a traditional team, we all want our developers to be involved, to be, you know, part of the team, like I said before, be team members and wear t-shirts. In our case, we don't care about that. If you don't want to, to care about the product, don't care. We don't expect you to love the product, to care, or even understand what the product is for. So you have your personal tasks, you have your individual responsibility. Here's the clear scope of what needs to be done. You do it in the right way. You, re you write a clean Java code, a good code. You follow all the guidelines. You, you make sure it works, we pay you for that. And many people are like that. Many good developers, that's my experience over the four, four years, many developers just don't care about this marketing, you know, Noise. They just don't want to know what this product is about. They don't believe in this product. They don't want to believe in this product because it's not their business. And I'm kind of some one of them because I've seen so many failed products and so many failed projects that the one, the next one comes to me. I just, who cares? Just pay us for writing the clean code which will work. We kind of see that like 99 of the startups, they just fail. So you're probably one of them. So, okay, we'll just write it for you, but don't expect us to be involved in your, you know, product, uh, product thinking. That's Part of it is that some developers are like that. But some developers really care about that. And I've seen them too, and we have them in our team. And they really like care about what's the future, how we can improve it in general. And these people, they suggest 
features and ideas as new tickets. So they just start working on it and see like, hey, this is the product which could be better in that way, in that way, in that way. And they submit tickets and we pay them for that. So we pay for new tickets. You submit new ticket, you get the money. You pay, you get new ticket, you, if the ticket is properly explained. If the idea you know, makes sense, then we pay you for that. So if you want to be creative, be creative, you make money. If you don't want to be creative, nobody's going to blame you for that. Just be a Java developer and, and develop the good code. So we have two types of people. And I think, I think both of them, I mean, I'm also kind of sometimes of that type. Sometimes I see something interesting and I want to contribute and I submit a ticket, I get some money for it, why not? But in most cases I kind of skeptical and I, you know, this product thing is, is not for me. So I'm not against creativity, I like creativity, I, I want developers and we want developers to contribute, but only if they really want to. We don't, want, we don't make it an obligation, we don't want to make it a, a, you know, a necessity for them, like a rule, like you have to be. If, you don't, if you're not part of the team, if you don't care about, about the product, we just kick you off. You're not a good team player. This is wrong, it's not a technical discussion. People, technical people have to deliver technical results, I believe that. So, uh, sorry guys, we have run out of time, so if you have some questions, you can, you'll find speaker in the general zone. Can I ask you a question? Yes, I'll be there. Let's go and talk. Thank you.